Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. There is a common saying in true crime, it's always the husband. We are usually joking, but the jokes are based on unfortunate statistics. But what if actual investigators felt that way and went no further? English jurist William Blackstone wrote in the 1760s, quote, It is better that ten guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. Some scholars say that principle goes back further to the Salem Witch Trials in 1692 when Minister Mather wrote, It were better than ten suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. If you really dig into that quote, It goes back hundreds of years in all types of situations. American founding fathers John Adams and Benjamin Franklin both said and wrote versions of that same quote when establishing American common law, much of which was based on some principles of the British legal system. But our founding fathers felt so strongly about this principle that the American justice system was founded on it. Those accused of committing a crime no matter how heinous or violent, are presumed innocent until proven guilty. This presumption of innocence was established so that anyone arrested for a crime is granted a fair trial. But what happens when this principle is not upheld and an innocent person is left to rot in prison? This is the case of Michael Morton. Welcome to episode 110, It's Always the Husband. The Michael Morton Story. Michael Morton was born on August 12, 1954. He spent his early years moving between different towns as he watched his father service the oil patches across Southern California and Texas. By the time Michael was a junior in high school, his family settled in the city of Kilgore, Texas, before he left to attend Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches. It was at SFA in a psychology course where Michael met his future wife, Christine. Christine Marie Kirkpatrick was born April 18, 1955 in Houston, Texas. And unlike Michael, who was often described as someone who struggled with social interactions, according to Texas Monthly, Christine was popular at her Catholic high school and around the suburbs she grew up in in south of Houston. In his memoir, Michael described seeing Christine for the first time in a huge classroom amphitheater. He said, quote, She was standing several rows up from me, holding her books to her chest, talking with and taking the measure of my roommate. Luckily for me, he wasn't her type. When Michael saw Christine walk away from his roommate, he realized he might have a chance with her. A few days later, he invited the lovely brunette to a party he was having at his apartment, and he said in his memoir that he was surprised when she said yes. They later went on their first date, where Michael took her out in a borrowed Corvette. A friend of Christine's, Margaret Permaner, told Texas Monthly that it wasn't long after this first date that Christine confided in her that she thought Michael might be the one. Mike was pretty reserved. He was nice and handsome with one of those Jimmy Connors haircuts, Parmenter told Texas Monthly. In his memoir, Michael said Christine was, quote, different from any woman he had ever met. She was so smart, not just school smart or street smart, but world class, real world smart. He further said she, quote, met people and made conversation the way most people breathe. She pulled people to her, coaxed them out of themselves, and embraced them in all their flawed and sometimes maddening glory. She was capable of intense and detailed conversations about anything with anyone. The young couple was deeply in love, and they were described as being passionate and vocal when it came to disagreements. A former roommate of Michael's told Texas Monthly, quote, there was nothing subtle about either one of them. They would argue very intensely. And eventually, one of them would start cracking up, and not long after that, they would disappear into the bedroom. According to the couple's closest friends, 
Michael and Christine bickered a lot, and each of them would argue their position passionately. No topic was too minor for a lengthy discussion. Christine's best friend, Holly Gursky, told Texas Monthly that, quote, when they argued, they were both very vocal. That's how their marriage worked. They got everything out in the open. Despite this, or probably because of their frankness with one another, their connection was really strong, and the love they shared was evident to their friends. When Michael dropped out of SFA and moved to Austin, Texas in 1977, Christine went with him. The two had grown inseparable since they began dating. Christine and Michael married on April 7, 1979, and honeymooned in Disney World. Originally, the couple had hoped to continue their education at the University of Texas once they got settled in Austin, but this dream ended when they realized that many of their credits from SFA would not transfer. Instead, Michael took a job stocking shelves at night in a local grocery store to make ends meet. Their new plan was to work for a while, then take turns going back to school. But as time progressed, so did their lives and careers. Christine became the manager of an all-state insurance company. And Michael was also promoted to management at his job. In 1981, the couple found out that they were pregnant with their first child, a girl. They chose the name Nicole and excitedly awaited the arrival of their baby daughter. When Christine was 22 weeks along, she and Michael went in for a checkup where they tragically learned that the doctor could not find a heartbeat. At a little over four months, they had lost the baby. Christine and Michael were devastated. Two years later, in 1983, the Mortons were delighted when Christine became pregnant for a second time, this time expecting a son. By the time she reached her ninth month of pregnancy, without any serious complications, she and Michael were relieved and they welcomed their son Eric into the world that summer. Despite the relative ease of the pregnancy, however, hours after giving birth, the new parents were informed that Eric had been born with a hole in his heart, causing him to not get enough oxygen. He also underwent surgery to repair an abnormality in his esophagus on the day he was born. But the Mortons were told that Eric's heart couldn't be fixed until he was at least three years old or 30 pounds. Michael said, quote, From Eric's birth onward, our focus changed. Every moment of our lives was dominated by fear for him, the demands of his stringent medication schedule, and the struggle to keep him alive. Michael describes in his memoir how for the first three years of Eric's life, the new parents lived in constant fear that if they missed a medication or weren't paying enough attention, Eric would die. Their son's health problems placed a heavy strain on their marriage. Michael's once playful and witty comments about Christine and their life together grew to have more of an edge, and it became clear to those close to the couple that their relationship was under stress. Michael would make comments about their lack of sex and Christine's weight in front of company. Christine's best friend told Texas Monthly, quote, His comments stung. Chris shrugged them off. She would say, just ignore him but they made other people uncomfortable. But as Christine's friend said, the bottom line was that Mike loved her, she loved him, and they adored Eric, and he was the most important thing to both of them. In June 1986, when Eric was finally three years old, he became eligible for the heart surgery he needed. The Mortons went to Houston for the surgery and came home two weeks later with a healthy son and a fresh outlook on their lives. Even with the loss of their first child, Michael described his family as being, quote, almost excruciatingly average. We were a chunk out of a demographic study. The house, the yard, the kid, the car. We had everything but the picket fence. It was good. That all changed just two months later on August 13th, 1986. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. It was Michael's 32nd birthday on August 12, 1986. He had the day off from work, 
and decided to spend it doing one of his favorite activities, scuba diving in nearby Lake Travis. After scuba diving, Michael went home and took a nap in preparation for celebrating with his family later on. In the evening, Michael, Christine, and their three-year-old son Eric went to dinner to celebrate Michael's birthday. The family went home after dinner and Christine put Eric to bed. Once Eric was asleep, Christine and Michael curled up on a blanket on the floor in front of the fireplace. Michael poured some wine and put on an adult movie in the VCR. He wanted to make love to his wife, but as soon as he made a move, Eric came running down the hallway. Christine got up to put Eric to bed, then came back to the blanket on the floor. Michael tried again, but Christine was exhausted and she fell asleep. Michael headed to bed, and Christine joined him a few hours later. He wrote in his memoir that she curled up next to him and said, Sorry, next time, babe. The next morning, Michael left a note for Christine on the bathroom vanity. The note said, Chris, I know you didn't mean to, but you made me feel really unwanted last night. After a good meal, we came home, you binged on the rest of the cookies, then with your nightgown around your waist while I was rubbing your hands and arms, you farted and fell asleep. I'm not mad or expecting a big production. I just wanted you to know how I feel without us getting into another fight about sex. Just think about how you might have felt if you were left hanging on your birthday. I-L-Y. I-L-Y stood for I love you. And I know that many women, like myself, would have been very hurt by a note like this. If only for the embarrassing part about her farting. But couples do things like this, lash out and later regret it. I've texted my husband when I was angry and then later wished I had waited and talked to him in person. But we never leave notes like this expecting them to become a piece of evidence against us. After leaving the note, Michael left for work at 5.30 a.m. just like he did every morning. In the early afternoon hours, the Morton's neighbor, Elizabeth Gee, was working in the yard when she saw Eric sitting on the front steps of the Morton house. He kept going in and out of the house and would often peek around the car in the Morton driveway to look at Elizabeth. At around noon, Elizabeth realized she hadn't seen Christine with Eric, so she walked over and picked Eric up. Elizabeth quickly noticed that Eric's diaper was heavy and needed to be changed, so she walked into the Morton house and called out for Christine. Elizabeth didn't find her, so she took Eric back to her place and let him play with her son. She went back to the Morton house to look for Christine again. In the Morton's bedroom, Elizabeth saw some dresser drawers dumped on the floor and the covers pulled all around the bed and tucked in. At the top, where a pillow should be, Elizabeth saw a pile of baskets and a blue suitcase. Thinking what she saw was odd, Elizabeth lifted the covers and found Christine's wrist. She felt for a pulse, but got nothing. She ran back to her house and called the police. Michael left for work at his usual time, ran some errands, then went to pick up Eric at his babysitter's. When Michael arrived, the babysitter was surprised to see him there. She told Michael that Eric wasn't there and that Christine had not called to say she wasn't bringing him. Michael was surprised. Christine would never have changed plans and not told him. He called Christine from the babysitter's house. A male voice answered the phone and said his name was Sheriff Jim Boutwell. The sheriff told Michael he should get home as soon as possible. Michael raced home, and when he got there, he saw crime scene tape and police everywhere. Upon arriving at his home, Michael went up to the door, but before he could get inside, Sheriff Boutwell stopped him and asked who he was. Michael answered, then he asked if Eric was okay. Boutwell said yes, and he was at his neighbor's house. Then Michael asked about Christine, to which Boutwell said matter-of-factly, Christine is dead. Michael recalls in his memoir how he instantly felt like he couldn't breathe and that he was drowning. It should be noted here that Sheriff Jim Boutwell is the infamous sheriff who got 350-plus false confessions out of serial killer Henry Lee Lucas. 
Sheriff Boutwell had Michael come inside the house so they could talk. Boutwell read Michael his Miranda rights, and then lead investigator Sergeant Don Wood asked Michael to sign a consent form for police to search his house and car. Boutwell and Wood spent the next few hours questioning Michael about his life, marriage, and what he had done throughout that day. They asked Michael questions about his and Christine's marriage, if Michael was having an affair, and whether their sex life was good. Sheriff Boutwell brought up the note Michael had left in the bathroom, and Michael admitted he wrote it and said he wished he hadn't. The police asked if Michael noticed anything of importance missing from the house. Michael told them a 45 caliber pistol he kept on the top shelf of their closet was missing. After hours of questioning, Michael was allowed to see his son. Boutwell, Wood, and Michael made their way to the neighbor's house, and Michael saw Eric. The little boy had clearly been crying a lot and looked disheveled. After staying with the neighbors for a few hours, Michael and Eric eventually went back to the Morton house. Michael insisted on staying in the home because he could still feel Christine. He said, quote, It was as though, by staying, we could be with her a little longer. Michael spent the evening attempting to follow Eric's typical routine. Eric ate. Then they played until it was time for bed. After Eric was asleep, Michael eventually made his way to his marital bedroom. When he turned on the light, he saw blood on the ceiling and on the headboard. Michael spent the rest of the night either lying next to Eric or pacing the house. By morning, Michael and Christine's families were both there. Michael was concerned primarily with the well-being of his son. He arranged for Eric to meet with a child therapist so that a professional could assess Eric's mental health and the effects of his mother's murder. Michael was relieved when the therapist told him that his son was experiencing no more than the usual signs and manifestations of separation anxiety that often follow the death of a parent. The therapist found that nothing indicated that the boy himself had been victimized. The day following Christine's murder, August 14th, her brother John searched the Morton house and property for anything the police may have missed. He found a blood-stained blue bandana about 100 yards behind the Morton household, adjacent to the woods. John gave the bandana to detectives, and it was found that the bandana had blood and a single hair on it. But due to the limitations of DNA testing at the time, it wasn't possible to tell if the blood was Christine's or not. However, the hair that was found could not be matched to either Christine or Michael. It was also on this day that the police would willfully ignore a new lead. Orrin Holland, who lived a block north of the Mortons, spoke with the sheriff's deputy that had been canvassing the neighborhood to relay information that his wife had told him. Holland told the deputy that his wife and a neighbor, Joni St. Martin, had noticed a man repeatedly parking a dark green van behind the Morton's home, near the woods, in a vacant lot. His wife and Joni had also noticed the man exit the van and walk up to the edge of the Morton's privacy fence. The St. Martins also spoke with the sheriff's department. The husband, David, told Texas Monthly that his wife Joni remembered seeing the van early in the morning on the day Christine was killed, when he left to go to work. He said, quote, I trust Joni's memory more than mine. But 26 years later, I can't say exactly when I saw it. The van had made an impression on both of them. Joni said, quote, There were only two houses on our street, the Hollands and ours. People dumped trash in that area, so if we saw a vehicle we didn't know, we paid attention. After he heard of Christine's murder, David called the sheriff's office to explain what they had seen. They kept waiting for the police to come talk to them or ask more questions, but to their surprise, they never did. Joni said, quote, Eventually, we figured the evidence led them in another direction. Like most of their neighbors, the St. Martins didn't know Michael very well. Joni explained to Texas Monthly that they, quote, said hi at the mailbox before, but that was it. He pretty much kept to himself. So when he was arrested, we thought, well, what do we know? They must have something on him. 
but there was little physical evidence found at the scene that actually pointed to Michael. Fingerprints were found on the sliding glass door that were never identified and did not match anyone in the Morton household. Another fingerprint, also unidentified, was lifted from the blue suitcase that had been stacked on top of Christine's body. The police also found a fresh footprint just inside of the Morton's fenced backyard. Christine's autopsy was conducted by Dr. Robert Bayardo. She had suffered at least eight blows to her head. Dr. Bayardo believed Christine probably died before the third strike. She had been attacked as she was sleeping, and hopefully, she didn't have much time to know what was happening or suffer. There was a six inch long, two and a half inch wide cut through her forehead. Christine's nose and upper jaw were fractured and her face was so beat up that the pathologist could not determine the color of her eyes. Dr. Bayardo found long, jagged splinters of wood embedded in her head. He also determined that Christine had not been sexually assaulted. Michael was brought into the police station for more questioning. After hours of being prodded over things he had already told people, Michael asked if he could take a polygraph to clear his name. Sheriff Jim Boutwell was very excited about this, and they scheduled the polygraph for that evening at the Department of Public Safety, often just called DPS. Michael showed up on time for the polygraph, but after hours of being jerked around, he said he wanted to reschedule. Naturally, Boutwell was not happy about this. A few days later, Michael was notified that he had to go to probate court because Christine didn't have a will. So Michael called an attorney friend to discuss probate. The friend suggested a day and time for Michael to stop by, but Michael explained that he wasn't free that day because he had to take a polygraph. This news shocked Michael's friend, who told him that he needed a defense attorney, and he set him up with attorneys Bill White and Bill Allison. White immediately told Michael to never talk to the police again and that he wouldn't be taking a polygraph through the police department. Instead, he could take one from an independent examiner. Michael said that Bill White told him, quote, I don't know if you know this, but no one's passed a polygraph test at DPS in the last five years. Michael's mother stayed with him and Eric for weeks and helped keep everything together. Michael eventually went back to work and spent a lot of his time with his defense attorneys trying to determine what to do. After some time, he eventually asked his mother to go home because he felt like he would never be able to stand on his own two feet if she was there to constantly support him. The next day, she reluctantly left. That night, Michael cooked dinner for himself and Eric, and they were having a good night. He said they danced in the kitchen, and they laughed. Michael said, quote, For the first time in a long time, I finally felt at home. But as he was cooking dinner, Michael heard a knock on the door. It was Sheriff Boutwell, Sergeant Wood, and a few other officers. They were there to arrest Michael. He was informed that it had been arranged for some neighbors to take care of Eric until Michael's parents could get back into town. The officers could have easily contacted Michael about his impending arrest and allowed him to turn himself in and make arrangements for his son's care. But instead, like much of the case, they took the opportunity to cruelly make a spectacle out of the event. Eric watched screaming as his dad was arrested. Michael's bond was set at around $250,000, which he couldn't pay, so he stayed in jail for a week until he was granted a bond reduction. After being released on bond, Michael was met with the nightmarish effects of being accused of his wife's murder. Sheriff Boutwell did not let up on Michael and neither did Sergeant Wood. They intentionally sullied Michael's name around town, giving bits of information to the media. Sheriff Boutwell even reported to the media that there was no sign of a break-in, adding to the suspicion around Michael. All of this unprofessional behavior could taint a prospective jury pool. The sheriff conveniently left out that the sliding patio door to the home had been left unlocked. Boutwell also told reporters that there was not an indication of robbery at the scene, despite the obvious crime scene in disarray, and even worse, he did not say anything about Christine's missing purse or the missing gun. 
Sergeant Wood even showed up at a local neighborhood watch meeting and told the attendees present that he had suspicions about Michael. Then he asked people to raise their hand if they thought Michael killed Christine. Boutwell made sure the community knew Michael as a sex-driven maniac who beat his wife to death because she wouldn't have sex with him on his birthday. Michael's neighbors treated him like he was guilty. Friends ignored him. People whispered. Michael was even fired from his job. Luckily, the employees' union took Michael's case pro bono and managed to get him his job back until the trial ended. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. Leading up to his trial, Michael spent his time trying to keep a routine for Eric while managing to work full-time, running all the errands, cleaning, and trying to help his defense attorneys. Before the trial started, the defense found that Sergeant Wood would not be called to testify during the trial. This raised red flags for the defense, so they brought up the possibility to the court that the prosecution or police hadn't provided all of the evidence to the defense, specifically something showing Michael's innocence. According to the Innocence Project, the defense theorized that the prosecution didn't want Sergeant Wood to testify so that he wouldn't have to hand over all of his reports and notes. On February 6, 1987, Judge William Lott ordered Williamson County District Attorney Ken Anderson to hand over all Sergeant Wood's investigative reports regarding Christine's murder. Judge Lott wanted to look through the paperwork to see if there was anything that pointed to Michael's innocence. The judge reported that he didn't find anything, so he had the file sealed. The trial would go on as planned. Michael's trial began on February 9, 1987. Finding an impartial jury proved very difficult, since everyone had heard of Christine's murder. Eventually, the prosecution and defense were able to find a jury of seven men and five women. The prosecution's circumstantial case theorized that Michael beat Christine to death because she refused to have sex with him on the night of his 32nd birthday. The prosecution claimed that after she was dead, Michael masturbated over her in a jealous rage. The defense said that Christine was alive and asleep in bed when Michael left for work at around 5.30 a.m. An intruder killed Christine after Michael left for work, stole Michael's gun and Christine's purse and wallet, then fled to the woods behind the Morton household. The defense said there was no evidence or witnesses linking Michael to the crime. Medical examiner Dr. Robert Bayardo testified at Michael's trial. He said that he believed Christine was most likely killed no later than 1.15 a.m. Dr. Bayardo made sure to say that this estimation was, quote, not a scientific statement, because as he said, quote, there is no scientific, precise method to determine the time of death. Even though Dr. Bayardo said his estimate was not a scientific statement, the prosecution told the jury, quote, medical science shows Michael killed his wife, and that Dr. Bayardo's stomach content analysis, quote, makes Michael scientifically proved as the killer of his wife. Stomach content analysis was not even recognized as reliable science back then, yet the prosecution rested much of their case on this proposed time of death. According to the Innocence Project, the prosecution made several false characterizations of Dr. Bayardo's conclusions and opinions, such as the, quote, we brought you scientific evidence that shows that she was dead before he went to work that morning. The prosecution further said that, quote, Dr. Bayardo's time of death estimate is the best medical science can bring us. It shows us he is a killer. The prosecution did this during their rebuttal meaning the defense had no opportunity to rebut these false statements. And here is what kills me. If that was true, why would Michael leave that note to his wife? He had to have known that the note would make him a suspect. Not only was Dr. Bayardo's supposed unscientific claims about Christine's time of death presented as scientific and matter-of-fact, it did not match what had been previously reported. Within just a few days of Christine's murder, Sheriff Boutwell spoke with a local newspaper 
and said that Dr. Bayardo estimated Christine's time of death as 6 a.m. That would have been approximately 30 minutes after Michael left his home to make it to work. Why did Dr. Bayardo's estimated time change so drastically? A Texas Department of Public Safety laboratory technician, Donna Stanley, testified that she tested a stain on Michael and Christine's sheets. She found that the stain consisted of semen only. The prosecution used this to support their theory that Michael had masturbated over Christine's body. This information about the stain was left out of Donna's original reports, which did not mention that the stain consisted only of semen. That meant that the defense didn't know about this until Donna testified, and they couldn't ask Donna questions to prove her testimony was false. On February 17th, the jury deliberated for just two hours before Michael was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison. Once he was in prison, Michael tried his best to stay positive and busy as his attorneys worked on his appeal. He majored in psychology through Sam Houston University and eventually obtained his bachelor's degree. Michael wanted to get his graduate degree in literature, but to do so, he had to transfer prisons. The new prison, W.F. Ramsey Unit, previously known as Ramsey One, was a prison with hard labor farms. Michael had to scrape drainage ditches and perform backbreaking labor at the new prison. But he did so happily, so he could work towards his graduate degree. As many of my listeners know, I read a lot of memoirs from men who are wrongfully convicted. Michael Morton's memoir is very well written and describes how dehumanizing prison is in very succinct ways. He writes, prison is all about routine. Prison is routine, followed by routine, reinforced by more routine. Later, rinse, repeat, for life. He writes about how privacy, while impossible in prison, is still valued. There are unspoken courtesies, he explains. You look the other way. You don't stare into a man's cell. And the consequences can vary, including one incident he recalled of a looky-loo that once he entered a common room had a cup of urine thrown in his face. The best way to survive in prison is to learn the rules quickly. And probably the most important rule is to show strength. There are many different ways, but Michael writes that as someone who did not believe in physical violence, he had to unlearn his own raising and beliefs. He writes about the reasons for prison gangs and also the time-honored method of striking first and striking publicly. You had to not only use your strength, but make sure someone else saw it. Some of his most visceral writing is about how fights are not what you see and hear on TV. Quote, In a real fight, what you hear is the unforgettable pounding of meat on meat, the thud of flesh colliding with flesh, the brutal snap of a bone being broken. This awful, unforgettable audio will stay with me for the rest of my life. And as Michael was learning to survive in prison, while also still trying to get an actual education, he was also in the midst of losing his son. Christine's family filed for custody of Eric, resulting in a nasty custody battle between his late wife's family and Michael's own parents. Their once close relationship with Michael had turned sour shortly into the investigation when Sheriff Boutwell had made it clear to Christine's family that Michael was their only suspect. They now hated Michael and believed that he did kill Christine. Christine's family won custody of Eric, who went to live with Christine's sister, Mary Lee. The court ordered that Mary Lee bring Eric to see Michael once every six months until Eric was 18 years old. The judge, who made the custody ruling, was the same one who oversaw Michael's trial, Judge Lott. While Michael's family still got to see Eric regularly, Michael wouldn't see Eric for a year after he was sent to prison. By Eric's second visit, now 18 months after Michael was sent to prison, the poor little boy didn't even recognize Michael as his dad. Michael described seeing Eric every six months as, quote, Watching him grow up on the installment plan, each time he came, it was like meeting a different kid. When Eric was 15, 
He wrote his dad a letter saying he didn't want to see Michael anymore. He didn't want to visit someone he, quote, barely knew. He describes his son's letter as hostile, and he writes in his memoir of his own despair, quote, Frankly, Eric was all I had left. He was all I was really living for, the only remnant of my life with Chris. In March of 1987, Michael's lawyers requested a new trial. They had found out that Williamson County District Attorney Mike Davis made a comment to the jurors after the trial was over about an inch-thick stack of police reports. Michael's attorneys argued that if they had seen the reports, they would have been able to raise even more doubt than they did. The request for a new trial was denied. Three years later, in the year 2000, Michael's lawyers filed an application for a writ of habeas corpus. They wanted the bed sheets from the murder scene to be tested. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted the testing. It was found that the stain analysis of Texas Department of Public Safety laboratory technician Donna Stanley was scientifically incorrect. The stain was in fact a mixture of seminal fluid from Michael and abundant epithelial cells from Christine, pointing to the stain coming from consensual sex between the married couple. However, despite Stanley's incorrect testimony, Michael's application for a writ of habeas corpus was denied. In July of 2002, 15 years after his conviction, Michael found out that the Innocence Project was taking on his case. Like many inmates, he had watched the trial of the century, the O.J. Simpson trial in 1995, where he first learned of DNA. He knew the name Barry Sheck, but he didn't know that Sheck was friends with his attorney, Bill Allison. Almost three years later, in 2005, Michael's attorneys filed requests for testing on multiple items found at the crime scene. The items included the bandana, fingernail scrapings from Christine, and evidence from an unsolved murder that was eerily similar to the murder of Christine. On January 13, 1988, two years after Christine's murder, Deborah Masters Baker was beaten to death in her Austin home. There were a lot of similarities between Christine and Deborah's murders. Both women had long dark hair and young children at home. Both were beaten to death while they slept, with blows to the head caused by an unidentified blunt object. Christine and Deborah were both covered with pillows and other items after they were murdered, and both victims' purses had been tampered with. There was one major difference in the cases, though. No one had ever been convicted in the case of Deborah's murder. It remained unsolved. The court granted testing on some items, including the fingernail scrapings, but denied testing the bandana and the evidence collected from Deborah's similar murder. Unfortunately, the test results from the permitted testing could not exclude Michael as the murderer. In October of 2008, Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott ordered Williamson County District Attorney John Bradley to give Michael's lawyers investigative documents regarding Christine's murder. When Michael's attorneys got their hands on the documents, they found a treasure trove of evidence Sergeant Wood had never turned over to the defense, including the accounts of the Morton's neighbors, who witnessed the man parking and exiting a van behind the Morton home before walking towards their backyard fence. The documents from Sergeant Wood also revealed other damning pieces of information. The day after Christine was murdered, a San Antonio business, the Jewel Box, contacted the Williamson County Sheriff's Office to report that someone had left Christine's credit card in the store. The caller also said that a San Antonio officer said he could identify the woman who had tried to use the credit card. Whoever took the call wrote a note to Sergeant Wood but it's unclear if Sergeant Wood ever followed up on the call. Chances are he was too preoccupied with his focus on Michael. On August 24, 1986, a little less than two weeks after her daughter's murder, Christine's mother, Rita, had told Sergeant Wood that Eric told her he saw a monster with red gloves and a big mustache attack his mom in bed with something wooden. Eric was adamant that this monster was not his dad and that his dad wasn't home when his mom was attacked. Eric said that the monster put a blue suitcase on his mom's body and that the monster had a basket. 
At the end of their conversation, Rita said, So Sergeant Wood, I'd get off the domestic thing now and look for the monster because I have no more suspicions in my mind that Mike did it. Instead of refocusing the investigation on finding the new suspect, Sergeant Wood tried to convince Rita that Eric was simply mistaken. He theorized that Michael had been wearing a full-body scuba diving suit, and that's why Eric didn't recognize his own dad as the killer. To make matters worse, Sergeant Wood told Rita to not have any other family members mention anything to Eric about what he said, quote, because they'll confuse him if they do. On September 27, 1986, a man named John Cross had contacted Sergeant Wood and told him that he had sent the Mortons a $20 check to help with the cost of Eric's surgery. John said that the check had been cashed with a forged signature nine days after Christine was murdered. In the report detailing John's statement, Sergeant Wood wrote, quote, Christine's relatives seemed to think that her purse was stolen. Of course, we know better. It wasn't until January of 2010, 23 years after Michael had been convicted of his wife's murder, that the Third Court of Appeals in Austin allowed the bandana to be tested for DNA. In June, DNA test results showed that a hair and some blood on the bandana was from Christine. There was also the presence of a single unidentified DNA profile from a man. This man was not Michael Morton. The DNA from the bandana was put into a national database, and on August 19, 2011, a match was made. The DNA was from a man named Mark Allen Norwood. Mark had felony convictions from at least four states, including Texas, and he had been out of prison when Christine was murdered. To top it off, Mark lived less than a mile away from that victim of a similar murder, Deborah Master Baker, at the time of her deadly beating. On August 24, 2011, Innocence Project lawyer Nina Morrison and Houston lawyer John Raley sat down with the Austin Police Department's cold case team. The lawyers handed over the information they had on Mark Norwood. After reviewing the new information, police looked further into Norwood. A hair found at the scene of Deborah's murder matched Mark Norwood's DNA. Two days later, Judge Billy Ray Stubblefield ordered the sealed Sergeant Wood's investigative reports regarding Christine's murder be unsealed. Michael's lawyers found that Judge Lott was not given all the reports that he requested back in the days leading up to Michael's trial. In fact, all that was given to him was two documents. A five-page supplementary offense report slash results of investigation prepared on the day Christine was found dead and a one-page form from Michael signed saying his house could be searched. Why did Judge Lott even believe that these two documents would have been all that Sergeant Wood had from his supposed nine-month-long investigation? It would seem the judge also had tunnel vision when he chose to accept these short documents as the only evidence from Wood and had them sealed. On September 26th, 2011, Michael's attorneys argued that he needed to be released as soon as possible. But Williamson County prosecutors said they needed more time to review the evidence. Four days later, the Williamson County District Attorney contacted Michael's attorneys and said they needed to discuss freeing Michael. The DA agreed that Michael would never have been convicted if the jury had all the information and that Michael should be immediately released. On October 4th, 2011, Michael Morton was released from prison. He had been in prison for 24 years, 7 months, and 11 days. A total of 8,995 days of his life had been taken from him. Following his release, Michael, his family, and his team of lawyers went out for a nice dinner. Then they all stayed the night at a hotel in Austin. After the hotel stay, Michael moved in with his parents in Liberty City, Texas. Although Michael was thankful to be free, he recalled in his memoir of how he had a lot of learning to do. Many things had changed over the last 25 years. Just having a cell phone blew his mind. He said he felt like he had stepped into the future. A few weeks after his release, Michael met up with Eric and Eric's wife Maggie. 
Eric, now a grown man and expecting his own child, initially struggled with the reconciliation with his father. It was difficult for him to meet with Michael, especially after being raised by Christine's sister and family. It took longer for Mary Lee and her parents to process the lies that they had been told during the investigation and trial, but Michael respected their uneasiness at his release. Eventually, and with the help of his wife, Eric came around to seeing his biological father. It was the first time he had seen Eric since he was 15 years old. Michael found that Eric didn't know much about his mother. It was so hard for Christine's family to talk about her, so they rarely did. Michael made it a goal to tell Eric all about his mother. On December 19, 2011, a few weeks after Mark Norwood was arrested and charged with the capital murder of Christine, Michael was officially exonerated. The co-director of the Innocence Project, Barry Sheck, said, quote, Mr. Morton was the victim of serious prosecutorial misconduct that caused him to lose 25 years of his life and completely ripped apart his family. Perhaps even more tragically, we now know that another murder might have been prevented if law enforcement had continued its investigation rather than building a false case against Mr. Morton. Mark Norwood was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the brutal murder of Christine Kirkpatrick Morton. An investigation into Williamson County District Attorney Ken Anderson's actions began in 2013. Since Michael's trial, Ken Anderson had become a state district judge. Investigators found that Anderson unlawfully withheld evidence. An arrest warrant was issued, and Ken Anderson was charged with criminal contempt and tampering with evidence. He resigned as state district judge and agreed to surrender his law license. He was sentenced to 10 days in jail, but was released on good behavior after serving just 96 hours. And yet, to this day, the Innocence Project points out he is the only prosecutor to ever serve time for misconduct that led to a wrongful conviction, even though 729 people have been exonerated since 1989 due to prosecutorial misconduct. That same year, the Michael Morton Act was signed by Texas Governor Rick Perry. The act required prosecutors to share evidence favorable to defendants to their defense attorneys. After his decades-long fight for freedom, Michael went on to marry Cynthia May Chessman, a woman he met at church after his release from prison. According to a story in the New York Times, when the couple married, they asked that their 200 guests donate to the Innocence Project instead of giving them gifts. The misconduct of Sheriff Boutwell, Sergeant Wood, and District Attorney Ken Anderson resulted in the wrongful conviction and 25-year-long imprisonment of an innocent man who was grieving not only the loss of his wife, but also the separation from his son. By narrowly focusing on Michael Morton as a suspect in his wife's murder and negligently ignoring other leads in the case, these lawmen allowed a real killer, Mark Norwood, to get away with Christine's murder. They allowed this man to live freely, long enough to kill another woman, Deborah Masters Baker, and leave her children to wonder for years who had murdered their mother. In September of 2016, Mark Norwood was finally convicted for the murder of Deborah Masters Baker and was given another life sentence to be served consecutively with his first conviction. Michael Morton was present at this trial and afterwards spoke to the media. He said, quote, Most times, life is not fair. You don't get what you deserve, or you don't get what you want. Today's a little bit different for the Baker family, who's waited so very long, and also for Mark Norwood, who's waited so long for what he deserves. Our government doesn't always get it right, but today, they did. On July 8, 2014, Michael's memoir, Getting Life, an Innocent Man's 25-Year Journey from Prison to Peace, was published. I will have a link to his book in today's show notes. Michael was awarded $1.9 million in state compensation, plus a monthly annuity of $12,000. He currently lives with Cynthia on a lake in rural East Texas. 
Cynthia told the New York Times that she never saw her husband be angry or resentful for his lost 25 years. Quote, I've marveled the whole time that I've known him at the lack of bitterness. As a true crime podcaster, I'm often at odds with my feelings about the justice system, how it so often fails us in both ways, how killers walk free, and how innocent men suffer for years in prison. While most prisoners are exactly where they deserve to be, prison in the United States is complicated. It's punitive rather than reformative or rehabilitative. And that is sadly perfectly fine with many Americans. But all of the wrongful conviction cases I have covered opened my eyes to how prison is like a human trash can. Men and women are dehumanized for the smallest offenses. Not in every case, of course, but that is where the famous quote comes in for me again. It is better that ten guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. And Michael Morton's reflection of what prison is really resonates with me. Quote, Prison is where society puts its problems, its rejects, its mistakes. In my case, the mistake was that I was there at all. And how do you fix a 25-year mistake that robbed a man of his life? his son, and even his right to properly grieve for his murdered wife. You can't. No amount of money will ever make that up to Michael Morton. But like so many other wrongfully convicted men I have talked about, Mr. Morton chooses peace. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by Hannah Newcomb with additional research, writing, and editing by me. The audio is edited and mixed by Chez Gray of Gray Multimedia. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Thank you to listener Lacey Golson for suggesting this interesting case. Please check out Michael Morton's memoir, Getting Life, An Innocent Man's 25-Year Journey from Prison to Peace, and also his website, michael-morton.com where he helps promote the Innocence Project and the Michael Morton Act. There is also a documentary called An Unreal Dream, The Michael Morton Story. And thanks again to all of you for your patience as I've been recovering from three back surgeries and sepsis. It's been a rough time, and I can't tell you how much it means to me that so many of you have reached out to me with support and love. Y'all really are the best. And please, if you're not already a member, come join my Facebook group. While we do discuss crime, We also share memes and have a lot of laughs. We worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, and our motto is, no shit ass is allowed. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept case suggestions on social media private messages, but please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.